This morning, I want us to turn our thoughts to uh, the parable of the forgiven servant, recorded for us in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. Matthew 18, 23 to 35. Now, in the previous verses, verse 15 to 20, Jesus Christ had just taught his disciples about the process of restoring a believer who uh, is living in sin, what we commonly know as church discipline. Having heard what the Lord taught, Peter responded by asking a practical question. He says in verse 21, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter here is thinking of a situation in which he's the one being sinned against. He's the one who personally feels the hurt and the pain. Now, know carefully that his question is not whether he should forgive his brother or not. His question is, how often should I forgive him if he continues to sin against me? Well, he's essentially asking, does forgiveness have a limit? Well, and now, having asked the question, Peter immediately suggests a possible answer. He says, up to seven times. See, according to Jewish tradition, an offended person is required to forgive a brother three times. After that, it's not necessary. So Peter here is being very generous, very, very generous in his forgiveness. Then the Lord responds to Peter. He says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. We need to understand that Jesus is not teaching here that we're required to forgive a person 490 times. He's not establishing some legal limit of forgiveness. He's simply saying here that genuine forgiveness doesn't have any limits. The Lord then uses a parable to teach Peter and the other disciples about the attitude of forgiveness. And it begins in verse 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle account with his slaves. In the, in the kingdom where God reigns as king, this is what forgiveness looks like. There was once a king, a sovereign ruler, who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And these were probably high governor officials in the province who were responsible for collecting taxes from the people on the king's behalf. And at a designated time each year, these slaves would appear before the king and would have to give an account of what they collected. So when the time came, the king found, notice verse 24, one who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, in order to really understand this parable, we need to understand how much is 10,000 talents. In the New Testament time, one denarius, which was a Roman silver coin, was a day wages for a common labor. It was about 20 cents. It takes 6,000 of these denarii, Roman coins, to make one talent. So that's about $1,200. In this parable, this slave owed 10,000 talents. In other words, he owed the king $12 million. Now, if the word 10,000 in the New Testament language is the largest numeric term. It's used figuratively to basically say it's a limitless amount. It's incalculable. Now, if we do the math, we'll learn that it would take this slave 200,000 years to pay back the 10,000 talents. So it's virtually impossible for the slave to pay back his master. You see, our Lord is painting here a picture of someone who has a massive, immense, enormous debt that could never, ever, ever be repaid. 
Since that slave was unable to repay the king, notice in verse 25, he commanded him to be sold among his, along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made, which was a common practice in that day. So the slave fell down to the ground and he pleaded with the king, have patience with me, verse 26. I will repay you everything. Now note carefully, this slave still doesn't understand the severity of his debt. He thinks he can repay the entire amount. So the king, however, the king, verse 27, felt compassion and released him and forgave him his debt. He not only released him of the impending judgment, but he completely forgave him of his debt. In other words, the king canceled the slave's entire debt. He didn't owe the king anything, not even one denarii. Now, immediately after leaving the king's presence, this forgiven slave, it says in verse 28, went out and he found a fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii, 20 bucks. He seized him, he choked him, pay me back what you owe. And then verse 29, his fellow slave fell to the ground, pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will repay you. But this forgiven slave, verse 30, was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should repay back what he owed. This slave who had just been forgiven of an unpayable debt by the king refused to graciously forgive his fellow slave who owed him a repayable debt of 100 denarii. So in verse 31, so when his fellow, other fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were grieved and they reported it to the king. The king summoned this forgiven slave and said to him, verse 32, 33, you wicked or sinful slave, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you. So you see, there was an inconsistency between the way that he was treated and how he treated others. Here was a man who had experienced grace and forgiveness in his own life, but was unwilling to extend, to demonstrate that same grace and forgiveness to others. Though the king, not being, being very angry, says verse 34, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay back all that he owed. Now I believe this repayment that the king was now demanding from the slave was not the repayment of the original debt of 10,000 talents. I believe the repayment was what he owed the king which was the forgiveness of his fellow servant. The king had this forgiven slave tormented so that he would have a change of heart and graciously forgive his fellow slave. Now, verse 35, the Lord concludes with a practical exhortation. He says, my, uh, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from the heart. If we're unwilling to graciously forgive a fellow believer who sins against us, God is going to do to us just like the king did to this slave in the parable. He will bring hardship and heartache into our life until we learn to forgive others. So what is the Lord teaching us in this parable? God expects those of us who have experienced his grace and forgiveness in Christ to extend that same grace and forgiveness to others. He graciously forgave us of an entire, massive, enormous, unpayable debt of sin. 
And therefore, when someone sins against us, hurts us, offends us, we should be willing to forgive them of such a small, insignificant debt of sin, no matter how many times it happens. You see, out of all the people in the world, those of us who are believers have the capacity to truly forgive others from the heart because we have been forgiven like no other. We understand what it means to be forgiven of an unpayable debt of sin. This parable is a picture of God's saving grace and forgiveness of a genuine repentant sinner in salvation. You see, all of us are sinners before an infinitely holy, just, and righteous God. And because of our sin, we deserve death, separation from God, and eternal punishment. Like the slave in this parable, we have a massive, enormous, immense, unpayable debt before God. And there's nothing we can do to pay for those sins or to remove the penalty of that sin. We were, we are, we were completely helpless and hopeless. But yet God, out of his grace and love, sent his son to pay the penalty of all the sins of those who believe in him, believe in his son through his death on the cross. When we come to, to come to God in genuine repentance, God forgives us of that enormous, unpayable debt of sin. He zeroes out our sin and grants to us eternal life. What an amazing thing God has done for those of us who have believed in Christ. The Lord's table is a time for us, for those of us who have believed in Christ, to remember his grace and forgiveness, to remember how much we've been forgiven in Christ, to remember that he gave his body and his blood on the cross so that we can be forgiven of this unpayable debt. If you're here this morning and you trusted Christ alone for your salvation, we invite you to join us in our time of remembering him. If you're here this morning, if you've never trusted Christ alone to save you from your sins, we're so glad that you're here. But we want you to understand that this time of communion is intended only for those who have already believed in Christ. So as you receive the tray, please just pass the elements on to another person. And let me encourage you to take the time after the service to talk with the person that invited you or one of the pastors, the elders of our church, and to ask them about how you can be completely forgiven of that unpayable debt of sin before God. Now, before we as believers eat of the bread and drink of the cup, God's word encourages us, exhorts us to examine our own heart before God to make sure that we're not living in sin, that we're not living in disobedience to God's word. So take a moment, examine your heart before God. And after you receive the elements and your heart is prepared, please take the elements on your own. Gentlemen, would you please come and service the elements? 